Our next presentation uh, will be by Dr. Uh, Mitchell Schwartz, and the title is Amplification and Restoration of Energy Gain Using Fractionalized Magnetic Fields <coughs> on Zirconium Oxide, Palladium Deuteride, Nanostructured uh, CF Lanner Quantum Electronic Components. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Professor Duncan. What I'd like to do in this talk, talk which is really probably better at 55 minutes than 20, so I'll have to speed it up, is talk about how we are using dynamic magnetic fields to change nanomaterials, change their output, make them more effective, and in fact it appears to create a whole new material science. Several people at my company didn't want me to come here to talk, but the fact is I trained with Dr. Von Hippel in the uh, late 60s to early 70s. This is a new material science and it may open up the way to get this field to full commercialization. The other interesting thing is that what you're going to see here is it may be that there's actually a second stage to cold fusion. And one of the things I'm going to show you, if you've seen my papers in the past with optimal operating point manifolds, which we've seen for all cold fusion systems, with this, we for the first time see two of them. All right. I'm going to give you a brief summary just to make sure you see the results in case I don't get a chance to get through the whole thing. At ICCF7, we showed the result of dry preloaded <laughs> nanomaterials, which we call nanors. These are two terminal components. They look like a one watt resistor, but there's a lot of things that go on inside and we drive them in a complicated way. And we get excess energy gain. It's verified and I'll show you how we do it in a bit, very briefly. And in the review, I will show that, and then I'll show how we're making new, what we call M nanors. These have a new optimal operating point, manifold, as well as the old one. They have a much higher energy, and most astoundingly, uh, they have metachronous effects. Now, what I mean by metachronous, I'm going to show you that when we put on these fractionated fields, that's a dynamic field as opposed to a static magnetic field, what happens is there's a massive change in the energy output. To my astonishment, after treating these samples, things kept happening. And uh, we'll go through that in a bit. One other thing, if you do experiments in this, uh, be very careful, you'll lose equipment. I, I don't mind, but you might. We've had a lot of people, we talked about this in the past, that we've collaborated with to get as far as we are. Let me give you a quick background, and I'll go over it as fast as I can. Uh, nanomaterials have been used extensively in cold fusion, beginning with uh, palladium black, the zirconium nanostructured materials, and now we have these preloaded materials, where what we do is we take the nanomaterial, we put it through a number of steps, takes many, many weeks at very low power, but long periods of time, and we make a new material, and we'll show you the results of that. Uh, these are what some of the materials look like if you've never seen them. Uh, this is under the scanning electron microscope. Why doesn't that work now? Oh. Okay, we'll stand over here. here. Here's an SEM and the breakdown of what's in them. Basically, uh, they tend to be zirconium at this level, palladium. Some people add other metals. What we're going to show here in this alloy is just the palladium with deuterium. Think about these nanomaterials as a chocolate chip cookie with a zirconium oxide as the cookie, it's electrically insulating, and you have these metal islands that are electrically isolated, and that's the purpose of the zirconium oxide, that we then load. Uh, size plays a big role here. We don't have time to get into it. Uh, the deuterons get very tightly packed, I'm not sure that all of the active sites are filled because I think we're putting on so much we're hitting other shallow sites, we're hitting other things that are probably not the critical site, but we do very high loadings. Uh, as I said, the zirconium oxide prevents aggregation. You can go through all this later or in the papers. Now, the biggest problem we had with dealing with nanomaterials is that they have sudden avalanche breakdown. And if you look at the, uh, this is applied electric potential in volts by log. Here's the impedance in ohms. And what we found is, to my astonishment, 
Uh, we had sudden breakdown. And uh, at that point, the power, which you read off here on the right, goes way, way up. That's not excess energy, in fact. If you come to our MIT colloquia, you would see that there are three regions, and two of them do not give excess heat. And so we build a lot of equipment to keep our nanomaterials in the right area. In fact, the, the estimates we have are loading are beyond belief. I don't believe it, but we do get a nice uh, uh, resistance ratio loading where it goes up and then comes down. Uh, these are what the early nanars look like. We're up to uh, six generations beyond it, so they're much more complicated. Uh, I filed a patent in July 3rd, and the U.S. government made it secret by the third week. By February this year, they said it didn't exist anyway, so forget about it. But I didn't get a chance to change the slide. This is basically when you deal with the uh, initial nanomaterials, they're over here. We go through a lot of steps to get to where we get to the nanors and the end nanors, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, it's very hard to drive them. We built a specific driver. When you have an electrical component where its impedance can go from 10 gig ohms suddenly down to uh, 10 kilo ohms, not only do you lose equipment, but it's tough to control. It took us several years to learn how to do it. Uh, this just quickly talks about some of the calorimetry. I don't want to uh, go into it, except that we use multiple ways of measuring the calorimetry. We'll look at delta T. We always use a control next to the thermistor. There's actually five, I mean thermocouple. There's actually five or six of them in here. We look at the heat flow out. So at the end, as I showed yesterday, we often normalize the delta T by the power in because that gives us a flat line and then we can compare. And we also do it for heat flow, and then finally we do the time integrated calorimetry, we measure noise power. Now let's do one other background. Magnetic fields have been looked at in cold fusion, mainly static fields. And uh, Dennis Cravens, Stan Spock, and the group uh, out at Spay Wars, uh, we did some for uh, aqueous solutions and quadras. And basically, what people mostly found in aqueous systems was that an orthogonal magnetic field seems to slow it down. Uh, it, 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 it's, well, Dennis Letts also found that, and uh, I really don't have time to go into this. Some of our nanors uh, give electricity out when we put on ultrasound. And when we put on the orthogonal magnetic field, which has no effect by itself, we decrease the output. So basically we went into this uh, having some idea that there might be an inhibitory effect. Now in order to read the slides from now on, you're going to see they're all like this. They're, this is time. This is the, the response. Here it's delta T divided by P in. So it's the input power normalized delta T. We always do a calibration pulse to check our equipment, and then we do an OMA control because we want to calibrate the thing. So for example, this would be the input to the control, this would be the output, this would be the input to the uh, NANOR, and here's the output. And actually this is series 7, so I don't even want to talk about that yet. Uh, <laughs> the ones we showed before, uh, series 5 and 6, we showed series 6 here at uh, ICCF7. Peter Hagelstein did a great uh, talk about what's going on. And here, if you look at the, here's the power in, delta T normalized and input power. So we can take the ratio to get the instantaneous power gain. If you want to do the excess energy, you're going to have to do the time integral, and we do that too, but I'm not showing them here. Here's the calorimetry. You see here's the input to the control. Here's the output, and the energies are a match. And what we see here is when we put in it, when we put the electrical current into the nanor, this is without the magnetic field now. I want to give you a background before we do the dynamic fields. Uh, here's our output. And what we see is that this is the deadly energy gain. I better jump ahead a little bit. Um, uh, the, this is what we showed at the MIT course. And, and, and the thing here is uh, this is heat flow normalized to input power. So here is the heat flow out for the control, and by normalizing for input power, it becomes a straight line. And again, you can take the ratio. So we have two different independent methods to ascertain that we absolutely had excess energy coming out. And here's the calorimetry. So here you see there's a match. This is input. This is uh, power. Over here is joules. 
this is the uh, OMA control, the NANOR, the OMA control, the NANOR, we repeat them. Sometimes they're close together, sometimes we pull them apart. Uh, I've got to jump ahead or we, we're, we'll get way behind. Now the reason this is important is that our energy density and power density of the NANOR are fantastic. And what we wanted to try to do was find a way of even enhancing that. So let me go back a bit. So we began looking. The, uh, the NANOR is a small device that's portable with the NANOR Explorer and it opened up all kinds of opportunities for us. I was able to do the CR39 imaging and the penetrating ionizing uh, radiation output that are in the poster session only because it's a small portable device. And the other thing we wanted to do was look at the impact of magnetic fields, both DC and uh, what I was doing was taking up to a 1.5 Tesla field and flipping it every tenth millisecond. So what we do is a pulse back and forth, pulse back and forth, and you will see that this really changed what happened. We wanted, here's our hypothesis. We did controls. Basically, uh, if you want to repeat the circuit, you don't use both of these. As you know, you only use one, but you can put it at either site. We put our DNR down here against the NOMA control, the thermocouples in the middle. And uh, here, this is before we do the field. This, uh, I jump ahead. Here's gonna make, uh, this is a DC field. What I want to show you is before we did the dynamic fields, we did the DC fields. I don't have enough time to really spend time on it. I apologize. We found a small increment by using a DC magnetic field with the NANOR. But it's such a small effect compared to what I'm about to show you. I'm going to skip it. What's important here is this is a dynamic magnetic field change. And it opens up all new opportunities. So let me go back here. Here we have time, where each count is five seconds. Here we see the OMA control. This is our calibration pulse on the equipment over here and here and here. This is an OMA control, OMA control. We get out what we put in. We put on the magnetic fields here, ba-bing, and this is without the field. And what astounded me was there were late-term effects. So we did two things. One, we kept increasing the magnetic field intensity. And the other thing we did was start measuring the changes in excess energy that we were getting out. And the thing that really surprised me is we went to higher applied magnetic field intensities. We began changing the material. And I will show you now some of those. So here, we put on, here's no magnetic field. Uh, we're looking at heat flow, normalize the input. It's a little different from measuring delta T, but it's just as good. And we can see that putting on the magnetic field, bumping, it goes way up. Well, we, didn't, we shut the magnetic field off here. And yet, it's staying up. So it turns out there's not only a synchronous effect, there's a metachronous effect that lasts beyond. And here's another good example of this. We went up to uh, 0 0.05 Tesla. And here's the control, here's the control, control, and here's the nanar, but being with the magnetic field, we're only applying these changing magnetic field intensity from here to here. And yet look at this. Everything that Peter Hadlestein showed you at ICCF7 showed an exponential fall off of the energy gain over time. Not as fast as I just showed it, but a slow, continuous fall off. We don't see that anymore. Once we put on the magnetic fields, not only did we increase the gain by a factor of 10 or 20 beyond what we got for cold fusion, but look at this, there's no magnetic field here, and it's rising with time. We saw cyclic effects that we'd never seen before after applying the field. Let's see some more of that. Uh, no field here, but it's still changing. We're getting more out now. This, it turns out when you can damage the equipment, and I'll get to that in a second. Here we see uh, control, 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 nice matches. We're off a little bit because of the heat after death. But here we're getting much excess uh, energy out here. And look at this. There is no exponential fall off like we've seen year after year after year. This is this something else going on here. There's either the induction of a ferromagnetic material or ferroelectric material, and that's why I think it's so important to show it. Now here, for example, uh, this MDNR, it's an MDNR, uh, we ran it in February, we treated it in June, 
And so here, here we do the calibration pulse for the equipment. Here's the OMA control to calibrate our accuracy for measuring the output. And what we find is that uh, here's our input power to the OMA control. Here's our temperature. Here's our input to the MNR and Bobbit. We get a nice output. But this wasn't the biggest surprise of all. The biggest surprise was that for the first time we saw two optimal operating plane manifolds. When I did the experiment, this is a drawing out of my lab notebook. This is what I expected to see. This is what we saw. And I'll go into this in detail in a second. In the past, only five minutes left, I'll do the best I can. In the past, the way to control cold fusion has been to understand that if you look at the function of input power, now here I stuck it on a log scale just to get them all together, and the nanomaterials can move a bit. But there is a peak point where you want to drive these systems, and the lesson is, is if you go over, you're actually not going to get more power out. Well, here, what blew us away? Here was the optimal operating point for cold fusion, da 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 da. And then we put on the field, and we get this. We do it again, we get this. We get two optimal operating point manifolds never seen before. I mean, the OOPs, single OOPs, characterize the making of tritium by code depth, by ordinary electrolysis methods, the making of excess heat in nanomaterials and in classical Fleischmann ponds and everything else we did. All of a sudden, this too. And even more remarkably, after we remove the field, this one falls, and this one's bigger than it was before. We are doing something to this material science that is, to me, amazing. Now, if you go to our poster upstairs, we measured the, uh, the penetrating ionizing radiation coming out. It's not very big. It's about 80 nanosieverts per hour, which is about 8 nanosieverts per hour, which is about five times less than any one of you put out per hour because of your potassium-40 and the uranium and thorium within your body. So we actually, when you go upstairs, got the measurements because we ran the equipment autonomously and had everybody else away. But what we found is this. This is our output from the, uh, the, the second optimal operating point. This is from the first. This is from Avalanche. We're now able to assign it. If you do the, thank you. If you do the experiments, be careful. Uh, we lost a lot of equipment. This is uh, one of the experiments where we did it. We get an incredible increase in output compared to no magnetic field. The DHDT field is here. Uh, this would have been over here before for the uh, gain. This is during the treatment and after. Look, it's growing. I don't understand. There's something that goes on with these materials where we really have to do some more material science. But we busted the equipment. And you can see that here. We're no longer able. This is where it went down. So it's something you've got to think about and weigh in. Um, let's get the static magnetic fields. We don't have enough time. <clears throat> Dynamic magnetic fields. Think about it. We're using them. The most important thing is there's a new OOP that appears. It could be, I mean, I'm not a crack believer. I believe the lattice is what's involved. I believe that what goes on in cold fusion is we make an excited state that then drops down to helium-4. And what happens is you have to uh, lose the population in that site. As Peter Hagelstein has pointed out, that can happen with phonons. It looks like it can happen with magnons, too. Uh, too bad that slipped out. Like I say, it's a it's a, a new material science. That's why I've got to share this with you because there may be a chance of increasing all of our power outputs and energy gain in order to make commercial systems. Thank you. Um, question. Uh, yes. When you applied the magnetic pulses, uh, did you end with a final uh, pulse or did you end with a demagnetizing uh, AC? No. Uh, we use a pulse sequence, uh, which is uh, uh, thousands of pulses. And what happens is uh, there is no other thing changed. We ought to talk about it. Maybe we can learn some material science from that. Very good.
Well, thank you again. Thank you very much.